Are you excited yet? Well, you should be. The Sheffield Steelers season starts in only a matter of days. Sunday, the 28th of August at the arena when we take on the Nottingham Panthers. Of course, the night before we are in war-torn Beirut playing the Panthers on their home ice. So I thought now we announced all the players. Um, that we've got coming in. It would be a good idea to have a bit of a catch-up. Uh, and as you can see, joining me from BBC Radio Sheffield, Pete Spencer, and, of course, Jonathan Fernley, not just a maths teacher, a very special one for us with all the super stats. You join us here in Lafreniere's, that uh, famous Steelers bar located in Birmingham. You're all welcome. <laughs> just never show up. Um, Pete, Jonathan. Are you excited? I think that'll be question one. You, Pete, you've spoken to all of the players. Your interviews have been brilliant that you've you've brought us all. Jonathan, what are our what are our thoughts on what Aaron Fox has put together? Let's start with you, Pete. Yeah, really excited. I mean, it's always interesting, isn't it? You know, big recruitment drive. You know, I think you you mentioned before we started recording something like twenty nine players going out and. Obviously, uh, a lot of new faces coming in. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how everyone settles in. Lots of fans are going to have lots of questions about who's going to fit in where and how good they're going to be. A lot of players coming from a lot better leagues, actually, dropping down, it has to be said, to the elite league. So, you know, you can't really look at their stats and say, oh, they're going to get the X amount in the elite league. You've got to kind of wait and see almost. So I think there's that kind of level of excitement as well. A lot of new names. And I think, yeah, it just the word is excitement, isn't it? You know, a week out from training camp, um, desperate to see the guys in preseason and at, at the shirt launch, obviously, and uh, and just see how they all kind of gel together, really. Jonathan. I always get excited for the start of a, of a new season and seeing all the players, not just for the Steelers, but all the players that are coming in around the Elite League as well. But the th- thing I always try and keep in my mind at this time is that the team that we have now and that we're going to talk about over the next few minutes isn't going to be the team that finishes the season. So I try not to get attached to too many of the players and put too many hopes and aspirations onto them because I've done that before with Corey Pecker and Martin Sampierre and Travis Alexuk and they've not lasted more than a couple of months. No. And we thought they were going to be good players and some of them were, but you know, circumstances change. So I try not to get attached to the players what I'm really excited for on that first game is seeing the style of play because I think it might be slightly different. Last season was all about speed. I think we've got a bit more power in the team. I think we can hurt teams in different ways. So I think it might be uh, a little bit different to the Aaron Fox hockey that we've watched over the last couple of years. I made it 16 players out, 13 players in. The 16 out, Bruston Stojanovic, Baruta, Danielson, Ellaby, Todd, Armstrong, DeLuca, Eberle, Feldner, Hodgman, Polak, Sointu, Shudra, Traversa, and Valoran. Out of those, was there any of those that you would have liked Aaron to, to keep that he didn't? Or is it, is it basically a thumbs-up decision? I think you'd always want to keep Marco Valorand if you could. Yeah. I think that was one that was obviously out of Aaron's hands. And maybe uh, Eberle as well, say? Yeah, maybe Eberle as well. I think if circumstances were still right, Eberle would probably be be coming back. I think Armstrong was maybe one of those that Carter and um, Carter and Aaron were kind of, if he wants another season and one last crack at it before he hangs him up, then I think you would have taken Big John back. Um, maybe maybe Dane Todd, but I know he was getting a lot of offers from elsewhere. And actually, you could argue with some of the guys that that are on the back end now, have you upgraded on a Dane Todd? I mean, we won't know until the guys hit the ice, but, you know, if not upgraded, you've, you've probably got to like from like with, with some of those new guys coming in. Jonathan? So much success in the Elite League depends on your goalie. So I would have been very happy if Rox Stojanovic could have been the backup in a goal uh, goaltending tandem. We've got two new goalies and both of them look really, really strong, but you never really know with netminders until you see them. Um, so I would have liked the sort of reassurance of having someone that we know can do it at this level. So I was most disappointed to see Stojanovic go. I'll certainly echo the thoughts of, of Valorand and Eberle. I think, yeah, Valorand and Eberle are the two that, that, that stand out. i got to be honest, I wasn't disappointed to see Stojanovic go. Um, he came in, he did a terrific job, an unbelievable job, way, way better than what we thought he was going to do. But cometh the moment where you're ever going to win a league title with Stojanovic. And whilst I take your point, Jonathan, very well, that you you like, especially in that goaltending department, to have proven players that you know, 
I don't think either Barry Brust or Oxtavanovich was going to take us to a championship. And let's hope the uh, one or both, or maybe a combination of any one of the four goalies that we've got, um, will, will help us that way. Should we should we start off with goaltending then? Because uh, Oscar Ustland was a player who had been rumoured for months, and in fact had been signed for months, but until his education package with the University of Sheffield's management school had just been finalised and, and completed, we couldn't announce him. Um, and then today, because we're recording this on Tuesday, uh, Matt Greenfield has uh, been announced. To me, I couldn't tell you who the number one goal is. I, I don't know. Jonathan, looking at the stats, who, who, do, you th- who do you think gets the start, the early start and, 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 and the first crack of the dice? I think Osland probably has the first go at it. But to me, Greenfield looks like he might be the slightly the better of the two. It's it's a really close call. But again, this is only judging off elite prospects numbers. And that's because that's, that's all we've really got at this stage. Mm-hmm. Everybody looks good on a YouTube highlights compilation. Um, what I like. Yeah, you don't put them up. You don't put them up if they're not good, do you? <laughs> no, absolutely not. Um But what I I like to do is look at what other netminders in that league, what numbers did they put up when they were there? So Matt Greenfield, um, his numbers in the the East Coast League are comparable, if not better, than goalies like Dan Bacala, CJ Mott, Matt Carruth, Tyler Beskarawani. That's really good company. The numbers are better than Shane Starrett, Matt Ginn, Kevin Carr, Shane Owen, Alex Dubow, the new guy in Nottingham. Um, so he might be, numbers-wise, the best goalie from the East Coast League in the last 10 years to come over here. Mm. Grossland, his numbers in Austria, pretty similar to Ben Bounds, Coventry's new keeper, and Pavel Cantor. Yeah. So, who knows? Pete, Danny Stewart called me today. Coach of the Coventry Blaze, he was chasing Greenfield all summer and uh, thought he got him at one point, but then it didn't happen. He had options to go elsewhere, but he he chose the state list. So he obviously knew Ostland was coming in, doesn't mind the competition. In fact, I think he had the interest from three elite league teams other than the Steelers. So, you know, and all those three teams, I understand, wanted him to be a starter. So he gave that up to be with a team that, in his words, were consistently at the top of the standings. You know, he won in in juniors. He wants that feeling again. And he wasn't drafted. So actually his route to, say, an NHL or an American League contract is a lot tougher. You know, he, he was telling me today that he there are NHL prospects and NHL teams will want their team, their players to, to develop in, in those lower teams in the farm system. So actually he's never going to get an opportunity then. So for him, the move, while it looks like 27 year old, what are you doing coming across this early in your career? Actually, it's about getting the start, getting the opportunity. And actually there is less competition competing with an Oscar Ushland rather than, you know, play, players dropping down NHL goalies, prospects, dealing with that, knowing that he's not going to get the opportunity. He's going to get far more opportunity in Sheffield. And as Jonathan said, you know, he could be a starter for any number of teams in this league. So yeah, it's a tough call as to who's the starter. Is Oscar Usland a bit more hungry? Obviously, he's had that year off. He's not played a lot in the last um, kind of year or so. I think only two games and maybe one period, I think it was, in that third game. Um, but, you know, he's got he's got great stats, great numbers. You know, he was a champion in Storehammer as well, so he's won as a professional. And he's chomping at the bit. And I think with Osland and Greenfield, both of them will be desperate to play And that's only good, healthy competition. That's exactly what we want, isn't it? It's interesting, Jonathan, that in the last couple of three years, it's changed in Sheffield with the two import netminders. Um, And and it's another another year of of that, two fighting for that number one slot. The old days of Jody Lehman playing 114 games in a a year has gone out of the window now, hasn't it? It seems to be you, you can ride your two horses. Of course, that means that we need... A British backup because if we're at full strength, import numbers, one of those two import goalies has to sit in the stands. But it's a different way that Aaron's approached it. It seems to be the way that all of the what you think have been the, the title contenders, the arena teams, are going. Belfast are doing the same, Cardiff are doing the same, Nottingham are doing the same. So if your budget will allow, then two import netminders is, is definitely the way to go. Because you always think of what's the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario is someone getting 
you know, injured on a Saturday night, you can't get another import in. Can you trust your backup? Well, if you've got an import backup, absolutely you can trust them. What you can also do is pull them after five minutes of a game when it's clear that, you know, a netminder's on an off day. And can you turn an early 3-0 deficit around? Absolutely you can. If you know you're not going to concede many more goals by putting the, putting the backup in. So you can't afford to throw away that league game in August. Sorry, that league game in October or that league game in February. They all matter. So being able to put out an import netminder every night who's fresh and ready, um, it's invaluable. I still want to hope that we can find some Challenge Cup space for either McLaughlin or Warburton to get some game time. Um, you know, if there are going to be games when the Steelers are four, five, six up, that they'll they'll get a third period here or there because we want those goalies to develop too. The ideal situation to be in is to have a top quality import and to have a top quality GB goalie as well and use that import on the non-homegrown player elsewhere on your roster. I think we were all delighted that young Curtis got another chance because I think we're all very fond of him. We've all known him since he was, I was going to say a small boy, but I don't think he's ever been a small boy. Um, and, and I think we, we all love the, the lads a bit. Um, what do we know about Jordan McLaughlin other than he was in um, Brayhead, Glasgow? Jonathan? Um, well, he's, he spent a bit of time in Leeds, uh, last year, um, on, uh, cause they were massively hit by, by injuries and COVID. They had a rotating door of netminders. Everyone had a game for Leeds last year. So he played a bit there as well as backing up in, in Glasgow. He also had a bit for those terrible Edinburgh teams in their final season. And so, you know, what a, a baptism of fire that is going into an Edinburgh team that's, uh, you know, they know they're not coming back. And, you know, you're facing 50, 60 shots a night as a, you know, as a teenager. Um, he's acquitted himself admirably. Um, I, the competition for the Steelers one and two uh, spots is going to be interesting. But it's the same situation down in Hull because Warburton and McLaughlin have got to fight for that ice time um, in Hull because one of them will get that and the other one will back up. And if the starter in Hull plays well, they'll keep playing and it'll mean very little ice time for the other. So I think that competition is going to drive them on. They can't afford to take a night off dropping down to the NIHL level. We see sometimes players drop down. Oh, I'll, just, I'll just go through the motions and keep my fitness levels up and make sure I don't get hurt. But they're playing for a start because starting is always better than sitting on the bench. I like the fact we've got competition for all four goalies. Bands and, Whistler are obviously, Bands and Whistler are obviously number one, two, aren't they? But there's a gap thing for who that third GB goal is. And I, I, I would imagine McLaughlin's got his eyes set on that. And why shouldn't he have, Pete? Well, he played GB under 20s level, didn't he? And as Jonathan said, he had 27 games for Edinburgh. He's not just played a handful of games. He's played a lot of games for, for Edinburgh. Obviously, those eight last season for, for Glasgow as well. So he's got a lot of experience. As you said, he's probably got his eye on that that GB, you know, third string being part of the of the depth chart as well. And he's going to want to play and he's going to get that opportunity if he keeps playing well at Hull. I think it's a really interesting and, and quite a shrewd move for, between obviously um, Ben Davis and, and Aaron Fox to kind of negotiate that the way that they have. I think, you know, it's going to bring out the best of the net minders. It's going to mean that Sheffield still have you know, that depth that they're going to need in order to play an import and, and rest an import netminder in the stands as well. Um, and it and it looks like, you know, potentially one or two of them could could get, because we all know how situations go in games. You may need to, to pull someone. You may, God forbid, get an injury on a night. They're going to get an opportunity at elite level to show what they can do throughout the course of a season as well and whether or not there's an opportunity in the Challenge Cup as well. So I, I think it's a really interesting setup this year. Um, and it's interesting as well in that Hull don't lose out in terms of, you know, getting their first pick because it's often seen, but, you know, the elite league, the big boys come in and ride roughshod over the the little NIHL teams. But actually, it seems like everyone's kind of getting a fair shake here, really. Yeah, good. OK, goal is out of the way. Defence. So we mentioned earlier, Baruta, Danielson, Ellaby and Todd away. Obviously, Baruta replaced uh, Dane Todd at, at the end. Neverline and Pichet and Petgrave. Initial thoughts, Jonathan? Uh, really impressed. Um, Pichet in particular, the numbers absolutely jump off the page in terms of his, his points production. And, you know, again, comparing him to other players that we're familiar with, he absolutely dwarfs the points production of 
uh, Brocklehurst and, and Fournier when they were playing in the in the same league over in over in Austria. Um, he's picking up as many assists per game in Austria as Colton Yellowhorn and Brody Reed and Sonder Olden. You know, this is elite yeah. level point production in a top quality European league. And will he play exactly the same role? Well, whatever that role was, give him that role in Sheffield because he's capable of putting up those sort of numbers. Um, and from the back end, that makes that makes the world a difference. So I'm really excited to see uh, to see what he can do. We were sort of hoping that Schultz was going to provide all, all that offence and the assists were there, but the goals never came. And I, I think Pichet might be the one to, uh, to step up and provide those goals from the blue line this year. I was happy he kept Schultz. We haven't talked about the three returning, mm. Jones, Phillips and Schultz. And, and Pete, I, I think I think Schultz came over, didn't he, for the Elite Series, then the first full Elite year. I think there's a connection there with Aaron and Schultz. Um, and no surprise to me that he came back. And I was I was very pleased that he he came into the conversation and he, and he signed. Yeah, obviously you mentioned third spell with the club there. And and actually you say that the points weren't there, but obviously he was leading the scoring for the, the Steelers defenseman last year. You know, six goals, 29 assists in, in 54 league games. He was still contributing, maybe not as much as he admitted he would have liked to. And I think arguably in, in this kind of setup, is he going to get that opportunity a bit more? He probably is. I mean, there are a lot of very good offensive players in there. Obviously you mentioned Pichet in terms of the points. But, you know, Matt Petgrave, in terms of the amount of goals scored, there's going to be a lot more scoring from the blue line this year. And I think that's only a positive. I, I think when you look at the squad in general, someone tweeted me a stat the other day, which was I think the team last year had about 200 goals if you looked at their previous seasons. I think this team has something like 270. So there are a lot more goals coming from the back end. It's a lot more offensive. And, you know, some fans have jumped on that and said, well, are we too offensive on the blue line? But actually, a player like Pichet, you know, he's just as comfortable eating pucks and playing on the PK as he is in terms of putting up assists. So, you know, he plays a great two-way game, looks really solid. You know, he's a veteran as well, which in a team that's getting a lot younger as well is important as well. I think he'll bring a lot of leadership. And he's already talking about being a player that could stay for longer. I mean, he signed an initial one-year deal, but, you know, he stayed for four seasons in Linz. You know, he's already talking about, well, if I like it, maybe there's an option for a, for a second year. So that's encouraging straight off the bat. I had a quick look. We, you mentioned youth and age. 31.48 we were last year, 29.64. It's two years. It's not a lot. But I think there isn't that lots of older, older guys. Is there? I know Cons is another year older. Jono's another year older. But he, Aaron has... I think made a conscious effort to bring the age, if you, the average age, down a little bit. Just before we talk about that, or you can add on to that, Jonathan. Never mind him; he was announced very early. But I've got to be honest; I quite like the look of him. I, I think he's going to be a, a a very, very good signing for us. If you've spent four years playing in the top mm. of Finland, then you obviously you can play. You know, You'll get found out at that level if, if you're not up to it. Um, so, yeah, he he does look good. Again, he's not going to be the flashy signing, I don't think. I think a lot of his games will sort of maybe sort of slip under the radar and maybe you won't notice him. But, you know, with offence all around him, that's kind of what he needs to be doing, really. Just one more thing on on Schultz, just before we, before we move on to other players. All the injuries and all the disruption last year, Schultz played every game. And his play every game was pretty much on the ice for every shift of every game. He took three penalties, three penalties all season long. And that's, I think, incredible for a defenseman. It's not like he's, uh, you know, he, you know, he's playing a, a lightweight game. Absolutely not. Um, but, you know, the discipline, you know, to be there and to be relied upon um, was really underrated last year. And uh, I, I think that's, uh, you know don't want to take stupid penalties well even better if you can not take any penalties at all like Schultz does and it's important not to change every player every year you need that core and what Schultz he isn't exactly a song and dance man and jazz hands he's not like an extrovert but he's an important core part of that team and with Sam Jones and with David Phillips you at least know that half of your D he knows exactly what's going on and then we've got three excellent additions coming in yeah and you want to submit Sam, sorry no, I was just going to say, Jonathan, that for me, and going back to Neville Einan as well, you know, he looks like a player that needs to be playing a, a top four role, you know, another 
good two-way defenseman, second in the league for for scoring as well. But actually, for me, it's who plays in your top four and who plays in your bottom two. You know, are we in a situation now where Davy Phillips and Sam Jones are playing? You know, third pair in 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 terms of this. Um, you know, and and. Davy Phillips, you know, you know exactly what you're going to get. Solid night in, night out. You know exactly what you're going to get from him. Sam Jones has really come on leaps and bounds in the last year. And obviously, you know, a two-way deal is great for him. I mean, we forget about that. He was the first player signed right off the back of the playoffs, wasn't he? You know, mm-hmm. on a on a two-year deal. And, and what a GB campaign he had in May as well, So, which seems a an awfully long time ago. But actually, are you faced with the, them playing, you know, your, your fifth and sixth, sixth defenseman roles now with the with the quality that you've got. I'm not sure. Interesting. We're not the coach. I tried to actually make some lines before we came on tonight. And I ended up with four different lines of four different lineups because there's so many different combinations you, you, you could have, isn't there? Should we get onto the forwards, Jonathan? Um, just, just quickly. I, I wrote them down here as I read them out earlier. Armstrong, DeLuca, I believe. just, just going back. DeLuca, we all loved him. We all appreciated what he did for us. Right decision, wrong decision, bring him back, not bring him back. I don't think you can afford to start the season light, can you? That's no. that for me, that was the thing. You can't wait until the end of September. You know, that's that's six weeks of games where you're a player light. For me, it's a no-brainer. You can't I mean, fair enough if if you know you December rolls round and you're a, a forward down and you need to bring someone in and he's available. But I, I hear that there are other clubs in the elite league that are potentially interested in in taking a punt on DeLuca. So Will he be available? But I don't think you can afford to start the season light. I was on a, an elite league board meeting call today without breaking any confidences. DeLuca's name came up and actually there didn't seem to be any takers. I know Manchester were keen or very interested a few weeks ago, whether that's still boiling away or... But again, Manchester, they don't want to start five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks shy, do they, John? They, they want to... They want to bring their whole team in on opening night. Yeah, because, you know, as I said, you know, points lost at the start of the season, mm. really, so at the end of the season, whether you're fighting for the title or fighting for a playoff spot. I just wonder if the Steelers have slightly changed style this season and it's not all about speed and scoring anymore. We've got more bigger bodies. We've got more guys who are 6'2", 6'3", more guys who are going to battle in the corner. And I... I just, I'm not sure that DeLuca maybe fits. He fitted with last year's team and we really missed him when he wasn't there. Mm. But I'm not sure if the Steelers are going necessarily in, in that direction. He'd be a terrific replacement if Martin Lattle, for example, was injured for a, for a few months. You know, he'd be a great sort of like-for-like sort of swap. Um, but, you know, is he going to be a replacement for, for Mitchell or McNally or, or Allen? No, he, he's a diff- different kind of player. Um, so maybe the... Uh, the spot in the lineup isn't quite there for him like it used to be. Always interesting, isn't it, when the uh, Nottingham Panthers general manager phones you midway through one of these? Just have to, um, I'll call you later, Omar. You want some help on something, won't you? Um, one player that is returning but almost feels like a new signing is Brendan Connolly, um, chairman of the Connolly fan club. Love the bloke to bits. Delighted he's coming back. Um, thoughts? Pete? Delighted to see him back. I mean, you mentioned, you know, chairman of the fan club. You've got Lafreniere on your wall. Who's that? Oh, oh you got cons. Cons on the wall. So, yeah, it, it's an interesting one. Like you said, feels like a new a new signing. I think there's a, the only question mark for me is, is about the knee. And I know he's had the operation and it's back to full health. But I also know that he was still rehabilitating and he is going to be rehabilitating until pretty much the start of the season. So there's maybe going to be a bit of rustiness. You know, I've got him penciled into centre my third line. Mm. So I think, and he, you know, what is he now? 36, you know, I think you know what you're going to get with Connolly. And I'm delighted he was back and he was a player that you definitely don't want playing against you. It's just that question mark for me about where the fitness is going to be right at the start of the season. No question that he's going to get there, but it's how long it, it takes him to get there. Mm-hmm. Lattle as well coming back was a no-brainer, wasn't it, John? Yeah, a, a, exciting player and, and you know, produced in, uh, in, you know, in many games last season, lots of game winners and, you know, a, a real crowd favourite. Um, 
I think Pete said on something interesting with Connolly. If Connolly was coming back as a first liner, I'd be concerned. But if you can slot Connolly in on your third line, that's great quality and great depth. So I, I'm interested to see what the you know the first set of lines ends up being in uh, you know in those preseason games because you know if Connolly is is centering the third line, that's great depth. If he's centering the second or the first line, then I'm, I'm you know, there's right. there are more question marks there. The crazy thing is that if Cons is watching this before he comes over, he'll be looking at the screen now going, I'm good enough to come and do the first line or the second line. He, you know, because in their minds, because they have different minds to us, don't they? They're, they're built differently. But, you know, he's coming back when I've spoken to him. He's coming back, coming back to play, coming back to be as good as he, he, he was before. The one player, you know, that I keep forgetting and – is, is Evan Mosley, and we shouldn't forget him because he's probably the most valuable player of them all because he can play up, he can play back, and he's equally as good, and he contributes every night. Um, but he's somebody that when you talk about plays, you, you do kind of he, – he fades away, and he shouldn't do because he's ultra important to us, isn't he, Pete? How good was he at the start of the season? What was he on a run of five goals in in three games or something like that? He had a phenomenal start to the season. Okay, he tailed off a bit in the middle, but no one's going to keep that level of scoring up for the whole season. And I think he was a little bit unlucky with GB. I spoke to him a couple of times while he was away. You know, he could have got on the end of a couple of goals there, which would have made a big difference in that tournament. But, you know, he's just solid. And as you said, that the, the luxury of a swing guy, how many clubs around the league would would pay good money to have a really good quality swingman that, as you said, is equally good on the back end, is equally good as a forward and won't miss a beat on either. And he just offers Aaron Fox so much flexibility. I mean, I think the deal to get Matt Petgrave over the line, you, he was Aaron, could, Aaron could take best available because he had Evan Mosey and he knew actually he could wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and then he could pull the trigger on Petgrave. So I think, you know not just in terms of on the ice, but all the other flexibility it allows the coaching staff is, is you know, you can't put a price on that, really. He's a core member of the team, Jonathan, isn't he? I've absolutely no numbers to back this up whatsoever, which is unusual for me, but really? I have the sense that the offence, it just seemed more explosive when Mosey was playing as a forward. Um, he's a more exciting player when he's carrying the puck forward from from the from the defensive positions. But when he was playing as a forward, it just seemed like the offense was was more dangerous and more creative. Um, so I'm pleased that he's initially starting as as a forward because I, I think that is his best position, and I think we got more out of him as a forward, and I think the team got more out of him as a forward than we did when he was playing defense. We need to keep Stop a check him. on that as the season goes because I actually think the opposite. I think he's he was more productive as a defenseman. But obviously, again, I've got no stats to back that up because the, the, that's not the way it, the elite league keeps stats. You see, he has three roles on the team, doesn't he? One, he's, he's role as a forward. Two, he's role as a defenceman. And three, wait for it. His father keeps coming into the country and his father brings the pink Whitney. So that's another reason Evan Mosey has to stay. It's very good, by the way. You should try it. Um the first rule of the Elite League at the end of last season was the crazy rule of 19 players, threw it away, and they made the roster size 20 players. And that then allowed uh, Aaron to go and sign Brandon Whistle uh, full-time as a proper stealer, not this up in and down in with Leeds or anywhere else. Um, he deserves the role as a full-timer, surely. Um, and I think he's a crackerjack of a sign-in. Again, another two-year deal, Pete. Yeah, and we were, we were saying on and on and on and on last season how much Brandon Whistle deserved to be a full time player. Um, you know, he just got better and better and better the more consistently he was in the squad. You know, it was his second spell with the club. It's well documented. The first, you know, he didn't come in in the right shape. But you just look at his mindset now, and he fully deserves that two year deal. Um, you know, six goals and nine points in those thirty three games, and they weren't thirty three games in one row. It was a uh, you know game here game there at the start of the season but as soon as he hit January and he had that consistency in the squad you really just saw his game develop you know big games against big clubs like Belfast scored a big goal over there and he just didn't he score looked... the winner in that big series over there and uh, it's a breakaway wasn't it and he put the winner away yeah yeah 5-4 winner I think yeah 
Very good. Your thoughts, Jonathan, on him? Continually impressed by him as the season went on and that he made that position his own because he was he was battling for that position with Alex Graham. And Graham still finished the season with, with more points than Whistle. Graham had 10 points. Whistle only had nine. But Whistle was doing the all-round game that was needed and could play centre as well, which is what the team was really missing when we were you know, so badly hit by injuries. So absolutely, that, that fourth-line centre spot is there. The points production needs to come because everyone will have a fourth line now because we've got you know the, the rosters of 20. Our fourth line needs to be everybody else's fourth line. Um, is there going to be enough goal-scoring output from that line? Well, there is if Whistle can start providing it. If he can turn six goals into 12 goals, um, then that's a, exactly what that line needs. OK, the big question, of course, post-season, Pete, is how we pronounce the name Daniel, is it Champini? Champini is what I was told. And Champini, I think I wrote... Jonathan, what are you going with? Uh, I'm going to about to speak uh, on this one. Yeah, Champini is, uh, seems to be the way yeah, to the go. the BBC people, they kind of get them right, don't they? Pronunciation what? guides. I'll, I'll publish it before the season starts and everyone can know how to pronounce it. I mean, there are times I've wanted to strangle Bob Ballard, but I've never known a bloke be able to pronounce so many names as perfectionally as he does it. Uh, so, okay, we're going with Champini. Okay. Um, I guess everybody from the outside says, oh, he's Marco's replacement. Is, is he, if there was a big signing for us this year, Pete, is, is he the big signing? Is he the one that we're looking up to, hoping to? I think he was the one the fans were waiting for. They were waiting for that marquee signing and who's going to score all these goals that we're losing, you know, 28, 29, 30 goals a season that Marco's walking out the door with. But I think as well as being a go- an out-and-out goal scorer, he's really good defensively, having watched some tape on him as well. Um, you know, played with Matt Petgrave as well. And, you know, Petgrave was a big fan of him. Champini was a big fan of Petgrave. So I think there's a lot of kind of mutual respect there as well. I put this to Aaron. I said, is he the replacement for Valorant? And Aaron kind of, you know, bit his tongue a little bit and kind of said, well, if you had to draw him up like for like and all the players that are coming in and all the ones that are going out, probably. But obviously he doesn't want to put that expectation on him. And, but I, I, th- I think he is. I think he can score from every position. He can score all kinds of different goals. You know, he's a quick guy, fits the mould. So yeah, for me, that's where you're going to get your goals for. But, as I said earlier, there are goals throughout this team now. You're not relying on a Marco Valorand anymore to get you 30 goals a season or to score you the game winner. John? If you use him as the focal point in the way that, that Valorand was, you know, the go-to scorer, you know, when there's a power play, you're always looking for that Valorand one-timer. If Champini is going to be the centre of things, then he can produce because when he's had that role previously, he has produced. Um, again, comparing his number, he, is, um, he comfortably was outscoring mm-hmm. Sam Hur and Sondra Alden and lots of other players, and we know how good they can be. So if he's going to be the go-to player on the first line, then that that needs to be his role. But again, it's it's the money ball approach. It's not about replacing Valorand like for like. 16 players have gone, 13 players have, have, have come in. You just need to recreate enough gold. It doesn't matter who gets them, but... I would be surprised if Champini is not right up there among the, uh, not just the Steelers' top scorers, but the league's top goal scorers. Interesting, Pete, that I know when I spoke to uh, to Daniel and when you spoke to him, he mentioned that Sam Hur, the god of the Panthers, the all-time, you know, little halo over his head, all things Nottingham, actually recommended Champini come to Sheffield rather than Nottingham. I think says it all. That's some kind of endorsement, isn't it, from mm-hmm. a former Nottingham Panthers captain yeah. to say, actually, you want to go up the road, you want to go to the Steelers. I mean, <laughs> that's one of those. But then again, you know, it. that's why I find it so interesting to speaking to players about who they've gone to recommendations for. It, it, it all kind of, I mean, we'll probably come on to, to talk about Scott Allen in a moment, you know, leaning on Evan Mosey and and obviously Ostland getting the, the Saxby Danielson recommendation. I mean, uh, going back to Austin, Austin was talking to Saxu Danielson, you know, during last season, you know, probably that period where um, uh, Adrian was was off the ice and, and that sort of thing. You could imagine them exchanging messages while Austin's, you know, stuck there riding the pine 
at um, Green, Greenfield as well. I mean, when I listened to your interview, he, he wasn't quite as enthusiastic as he was when he spoke to me, but he said to me that Greenfield, he says, I messaged DeLuca. He says to say, um, Sheffield are in. What do you think? And he says, in seconds, DeLuca came back. Great place, great people, great venue, great team. Got to go there. You'll love it. And when you get somebody who's so enthusiastic like that, you, you think to yourself, hey, it must be a good place. No brainer, isn't it? No, that's no what brainer. Greenfield said to me. Absolute no brainer. And he, he he didn't quite give DeLuca all the credit, but he said it was a factor. Mm. And you know, Anthony, he said, uh, what was the phrase he said? He said, when when you know DeLuca's going to be honest with you, and when he yeah. says it's where you want to go, and the fans are great, and the arena's great, and the setup's great, you know, you just take that as red. That's, that's what it is. It's important, Jonathan, isn't it? Because the hockey world is a small world, and 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 players see what goes on at other clubs, hear about things from other clubs. And uh, you've only got to treat one or two players badly and it gets around. And I think the way, certainly in the latter years, in in the Tony Smith years, certainly the way that the players are treated, it goes a long way. You get good housing, you get a decent car, you get paid on time, your equipment's there. Everybody in the whole club is is going in the same direction. I think that does make a difference. It does. And uh, the Steelers have have an advantage over other clubs in terms of what they can offer in, in different respects regarding housing and, and cars and, and university deals as well. Um, you know, there are special things, you know, about playing in Belfast and playing in Nottingham, playing in Cardiff and playing in Sheffield. And, you know, so when you're competing for the same sort of players, essentially, it, those recommendations often make that extra little bit of difference because the wages are going to be similar, the packages are going to be similar. So if you can just have that recommendation from someone, it might just tip things in uh, in the Steelers' favour, and it looks to have done here. Just one thing, what what was special about playing in Nottingham? Well, people keep signing there. <laughs> Maybe that's what Omar was on the phone to you about. <laughs> you never know, you never know. I'll get back to him later. Get back to him later. Um, Pete, when you've spoke to Aaron Fox... Uh, as you as you've done after every every signing, I don't know if he was more or less excited when the name Brett Newman got mentioned, but I just get the feeling he's super excited about Brett Newman. Um, he, he spent longer on the phone with me explaining different things. He he just seemed to be we've got a good one here, maybe a tad under the radar because of the age and not a vast CV behind him, but. Every single thing he said to me about Newman, he was excited about. I don't know if you picked up on that. Yeah. The the quote still sticks in my mind. He, he just went, man, I love Newman, Newman's game. Man, yeah. I love it. And that, like, you could just tell there was that, that kind of passion there in that he'd got one that no one else was looking at. And I think when you, you know, a lot of fans, because it, it was on the, obviously it was announced as the triple. It was the McNally, Champini and Newman. And everyone was kind of like, yes, yes, uh, who? Well, we'll work it out later on. And I think actually Brett Newman, along with Champini, is probably, you know, up there. I mean, Aaron was saying, to be honest, I've already sort of drawn some pairs up and I think Champini is going to play with Newman. And if you're that excited about Daniel Champini, you should be equally as excited about Brett Newman, you know, 23 year old. And you only have to look at the amount of goals he scored for Oshawa. I mean, 40, he had two 45 goal seasons. And I know that's obviously playing in the OHL against lads that are the same age and similar size and stature and that sort of thing. But, you know, he's then gone and played in the American league at Allen where Scott Conway was, and he had better stats than Scott Conway. And I know you can't directly say he's going to do that in the elite league, but, you know, what Jonathan was saying earlier about comparing players and what they've done in the same leagues. I mean, he was playing on the same line as Scott Conway. So, you know, the signs for me with with Brett are good. Maybe the only question mark is the fact that he's an undersized guy, but, you know, he's still doing the job and he's still doing the job in the OHL against guys that are bigger, stronger, but the that are just his age. So I think you look at his release, he's got a great shot on him. He can play centre. He looks good at the draw. I think there's a lot to like about Brett Newman as Aaron Fox is rightfully getting excited about. Jonathan, what were your thoughts on him? It's always harder with the OHL than any of the other leagues to look at numbers and compare because you can be 18 years old, you can be 23 years old um, and players' numbers increase as they get older. 
um, you know, and and so the numbers do get better and better and better, but then everybody's numbers get better and better and better. So what I thought I'll do is, that, well, I'll look at his age 20 season because the last full season that Liam Kirk had in the OHL was his age 20 season. Yeah, he massively outscored what Liam Kirk was doing at the same age at that level. And then obviously you get a year older and you score even more goals and, you know, you move on. So in terms of the like for like, it seems like he's the sort of the new Eberly and he's the young player that you maybe took a bit of a flyer on, but might be a sneaky good goal scorer. Well, Newman seems to already have a bit more goal scoring pedigree than, than Eberly arrived with. And, you know, he can score 30 in this league. So, you know, with, with top line minutes, Newman, could uh, be able to produce something similar, I reckon. Where do you want to go next, Pete? We've got Scott Allen, Brendan McNally, Mason Mitchell, and uh, and Adam Rasker. Oh, should we should we start with Rasker? He, uh, I think we've all probably got him paired up with Martin Lafleur, haven't we? Purely on the um, they know each other. There's a connection. They're both, you know, the Czech lads. Um, and if he's anything like Martin Lafleur, then Adam Rasker is going to be a hit. Yeah, and. You know, you look at his stats in the in the Czech Extra League, better stats than Martin Lattel, better stats than Joseph Makiska as well. And you mm. remember what a good centre he was during the yeah. Elite Series as well. So, yeah, I think you, you have him penciled in at centre. You can play a bit of left wing as well. You know, first or second line centre, going to play initially with Martin Lattel. And, you know, if he's anything like Martin Lattel in terms of quickness, in terms of speed, you know, Lats was joking or he... I put him through his paces. He's going to struggle to keep up with me. We'll, we'll see, won't we? And I think if he's anything like, you know, if he's a third of the player of Martin Latale, I think you're on to a good one, really. You happy with him, uh, Jonathan? He's still probably the biggest question mark of all yeah. players, just because as, as with Latale, you know, the numbers playing in the roles that he had in that top check league, he came and did a very different role with dealers where he was expected to score the goals and, and be that go-to player. Same sort of thing with Raska. Some players will, will thrive on that opportunity in the same way that Lattel did. Others, maybe they won't. So I'm hopeful, but he, he's he's the one that I'm, I'm not concerned about, but I'm more comfortable with all the other signings so far. I don't know who Aaron's contact is in Czech, but the signings he's made from over there haven't let us down, have they? We haven't signed a bad check. And no. they've all performed for us. And Pavel Cantor? Pardon? Pavel, Pavel Cantor. Cantor. Well, I think if Pavel Cantor had just stuck around another four or five weeks, he'd have probably been our number one goalie, wouldn't he? Yeah, he, just he, had, he probably he had, he had, a just had a bad start. Yeah, he had a bad start. And, hey, the big lad, Trancinski, you know, and even the lad who's gone home here, now Polak. I mean, what a good player. I, I would have loved to have seen him four or five years ago. Mm. I think he was just a broken man when he came to us and he still performed pretty well for us, but he, he, he was a good player. So, so Aaron hasn't signed a dud check yet, which is always yeah. good. Um, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm excited with him. Um, I guess, Jonathan, you've touched on it. We are a bit of a different team this year, a bit more physical, got a bit more size and we can combine maybe Scott Allen and Brandon McNally and Mason Mitchell in this, this last part of the chat because they're the guys, I guess, who we all expect to provide a little bit of muscle and a bit of presence and a little bit of going and digging it in and digging it out. You yeah, for, I think the Steelers... Oh, sorry, jump. Yeah. yeah, so I think the Steelers needed to be able to win games in different ways last year. We saw a lot of teams come to the arena and they would just be happy to sit back, absorb pressure, and when they did get the puck, they'd get to the red line, dump it and get a fresh line out there and, and protect the house. And the games sort of it's sort of in the run up to Christmas and just after, particularly against the Scottish teams, Glasgow gave us all sorts of trouble. We just couldn't break them down and we you know had to scrape through late on in a couple of those. Fife weren't easy to get through. Dundee gave us all sorts of trouble. Because if you neutralize the Steelers' speed, you took away a lot of the game. I'd like to think that those three players are going to play on potentially three different lines, mm. meaning that somebody can go and be a physical presence in the corner and, and turn as a puck over when maybe we weren't expecting to. Someone can provide a big net front presence on the power play because we were talking earlier about goals from defensemen. Well, there certainly weren't many on the power play. Um, and so if 
your power play is one dimensional. It was very successful, but sometimes you need another option. So I'd like to think that we have a blue line shooting option plus big bodies to go in front of the net and, and cause chaos and pick up rebounds. Which players will end up in which role? We'll, we'll wait and see. But I like to think that we look a bigger team. Now, one thing that Douse always says is that whenever he watches the players standing there for the national anthem, the other team just always looks taller than the Steelers. They always look bigger. I don't think that's going to be the case this year. That's because he's sat so far back. He's, he's only a short lad himself. But what did you think? You like the idea of that we're going to be a bit different? Yeah, I think, I, as Jonathan said, it, it, and I, I was nodding, nodding along as you were saying, you know, you neutralised speed last year and there didn't seem to be a plan B. And it was one of the criticisms of of the team last year. You know, we aren't physical enough, you know. And I think fans maybe meant that more in a, we're getting out muscled, out worked off the puck in the corners, but also no one's standing up for the team. And I think you're going to get all of that from Brandon McNally, Scott Allen and Mason Mitchell. I really like the look of Scott Allen. And when I spoke to him, really good talker. Mm. But also it made me think, when was the last time Sheffield had a really out and out power forward? Guillaume Debien? I mean, you could argue John Armstrong was a power forward, but maybe not in the same sense as a, a Debien. And that mm. was the last year, you know, the, the year obviously we won the playoffs when we were really successful. And I just wonder if we need a bit of that, you know, the guy that's going to stand you know, on top of the goalie that's he's got nice hands out in front. He's got a really deft touch as well as being a, a kind of net front presence guy. You know, he can play center as well as left wing. He can win draws on the backhand. You know, that's another great option as well. And he's about a point a game as well. So actually I, I've got him penciled in on my, on the, my top unit with, with Newman and Champini. I think actually, you know, that's that's not a bad option. And that's a bit of a different look to that line as well. If you combine it with, you know, the pure goal scoring and, you know, the the young centre, actually you want a bit of grizzle as well on that top unit. Yeah, I had him in as a top six. You talked about him being a good uh, talker. The best quote I heard off any of the players this year, I uh, said to Brandon McNally, I went, um, so what was it the head coach Aaron Fox said to you that convinced you to come to the Steelers? He said, absolutely nothing. I chased him all summer and had to convince him I was the kind of player that he needed to win. Um, and when you look at McNally, he has got a very strange resume where, and he was very forceful in pointing this out, if you want him to play on your top six, he'll score you 30-40. And if you want him to play on your bottom six, he'll go and dig it out and do whatever's taken. He was, a, he was an interesting signing. And he brings a winning mentality because he won last year in Cardiff, Jonathan. I like that. Yeah, and difficult circumstances for Cardiff at the end of the season with the, you know, the the late change of coach, which caught everybody by surprise. It would have been, you know, easy for them to, you know, have struggled in the playoffs, but you know, they they powered through and 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 you know won in, you know, in some style in the end. And and he was a part of that. It it was a surprise when his name was uh, was announced for me because I just never considered that we would be able to take players from Cardiff. That doesn't normally happen. You know, Cardiff have had such a good environment there in recent years. The players have gone there and, and stayed there for a long time. So that someone wants to come to Sheffield again, that's a, you know, another, you know, major tick in, in the, uh, you know, for the Steelers franchise in terms of everything that they do, not just on the ice, but off the ice, that he wants to come and play here. Where his role will end up being, I, I'm really not sure. Initially, I'd sort of got him on a fourth line with, with Whistle and Phillips, but then thought, ah, he's... Mm. Where, where does the creativity come from there? It feels like he's more of a goal scorer. So I feel like the third line might well end up being uh, being more his home. Imagine him and Connolly together. Ooh. Yeah, I think sort of Connolly and Dowd, you know, you've got a, a mixture there of you've got the goals, you've got the creativity, but then you've got the protector, you've got that bigger body because, you know, Connolly's going to go and cause some nuisance. But, you know, whilst Connolly can stick up for himself, McNally can also tower over some people. Mason Mitchell, we haven't spoke about him, Pete. Again, another lad who spoke well and came across very well in our interviews. Yeah, I like the look of Mason Mitchell as well. I think he's a player as well that's just going to add to that physicality. Um, yeah, as you said, another guy that talks well and another guy that can drop the gloves. I mean, you know, it's another thing to add a, a tough physical player. He, again, can, can go into the corners and kind of dig it out again. But... Interesting quote from Aaron. He can also skate with speed. So actually he can potentially be a glue guy for that Rascal Latal line. 
So, you know, if you think those guys are quick, they're going to need someone to to keep up with them. You know, maybe Mitchell adds a, a different dimension to that line. You know, you've got the smooth skating checks, but then the physicality of Mitchell. I quite like the the look of that as well. Um, and yeah, you know, he's got some he's got some good stats in in the East Coast as well, you know, vastly experienced. He's he's played up in the American League as well, experienced and and I think he was saying that he was looking to make the move a couple of seasons earlier. If it hadn't been for COVID, he was going to look at Europe. So, yeah, I think he's excited about, about what he sees. The two players we haven't mentioned, Jonathan, um, Robert Dowd and Jonathan Phillips. Jono comes back at 40. I saw him last week. <laughs> Looks like a Greek god. Um, chiseled. I hate standing next to him. Um, and Robert Dowd, testimonial year. I mean, he's he's been around forever and he just continues to be one of our probably will go down as one of our all-time greats British players if not our best British player um just a quick word on on those two and how important they still are for us Jonathan Phillips will play his 1000th Steelers game um during this coming season you know even before uh, before we get to Christmas I think if uh, I've got the, if I've read the numbers right it, it's just incredible that he, he continues to to play at at a high level because the demands of the elite league now are, are higher than there have ever been. The standard is, is uh, exceptionally high and he's got to play big fourth line minutes this year. It's four line hockey again, and he's got to be a part of it, but you know, he's still going to be the best penalty killer around because you know, that level of that part of his game has just got better and better and better as time has gone on. My one hope for Robert Dowd is that it's an injury free year because if it's an injury free year, there'll be 35 goals. Um, the one thing that's hurt Dowd in recent years has been little niggles and bumps. And he's, we see him after the game doing the podcast, and he'll always stop and talk to us. And then he'll always turn and hobble away with an ice pack around his. He had, he had an injury for his car. For, touch wood. He had an injury for a year last year, didn't he? Which yeah, was, he didn't have a, a healthy year last year. No, Still scored 30. But if we can get 70 games played out of Robert Dowd, um, it makes so much difference because we can, you can't replace Robert Dowd if he's injured. My view on Dowdy has always been when, when people go, oh, he's injury prone. He's not injury prone because he got a broken hand. Somebody shot a puck at him. I remember being at the Continental Cup where he got tripped and he goes into the boards and, you know, it's not like he's pulling groins or hamstrings or calves or he's, oh, Michelle, you know, it, it, it's injuries because of the way he plays the game with such tenacity and, uh, and ferociousness, doesn't he, for, for a, a relatively small-bodied um bloke he's easy replaceable as jonathan said isn't he Pete? yeah he is and yeah i was there and and that was an awful injury in the in the consensus cup a couple of years ago but you know played 44 uh, 54 games last season 54 points 30, you know 29 goals that's exactly the production that you get from a healthy robert dowd and you're right he's always going to have bumps and scrapes and niggles from the way he plays the game because he plays the game so aggressively and on the edge but all of the injuries are impact injuries. As you said, he's not pulling a groin here. He's, you know, he's not looking at a, you know, a touch wood, an ACL or an MCL here. It's, it's because of the way he, he plays the game. He plays hundred miles an hour and he flies into every single, um, you know, kind of check or, or, you know, going into the corners, goes in to dig it out, but it'll also be there to, to stick it in the net. So you can't, you can't buy a player like Robert Dowd. And, you know, I know it was controversial when he was voted best British player of the year last year, but, you know, I think he deserved it, even though he wasn't at the playoffs. If you're a Brit in the league, you take above Robert Dowd. I don't think so. I think Belfast fans might say Conway, but for me, the longevity and, and you know, Dowd has done it seasons after season after season. Conway's so far come in and done it for one season, but... You know, for me, it's it's still Dowdy, and Dowdy's only thirty four. It seems like he's been around a lot longer than that, almost as long as Jonathan Phillips. But you know, still thirty four, and still some good years in him. Yeah, I mean that Pellini came into Nottingham, didn't he? and you know he did his things, and I know he's over in uh, in Herning in Denmark. But Dowdy looked at him, and I think just outplayed him, outscored him, was better than him. And I, I, I certainly, if you were. You know what, if Steve Thornton phone me up for a trade right now, there's not a chance I'd trade any other Brit in the country for, for Robert Dowd. Thoughts, John? Some players come over and have spectacular seasons. Some players have two really good seasons or three. Robert Dowd's had a dozen of them. Um, 
you just know what you're going to get from uh, from Robert Dowd every year. And you know there's going to be that hot streak as well when he'll carry the team. Once he passed uh, Jeff Louis' record, he was the Steelers' offence for about a month. You know, scoring, I seem like a couple of goals every night. And it, it you know, it, it carried the team through those those injuries that we were having at that particular moment. When Dowd is hot, there's, there's those no are twenty matter. players we've discussed for the twenty man roster. I'll just throw another name at you right now, folks watching at home. It's Tuesday evening as we're recording this, um, and on Friday, and I don't think this is going to get edited and go out past Friday. On Friday, we're going to announce uh, young Alex Graham on a two way deal with the Steel Dogs and the Steelers, and it's important for Alex Graham that he still has a connection with the Steelers because he's a superb little talent, isn't he? That, you know, down the line, the Phillipses, both of them, um, Dowd, they're not going to last forever. And we have to replenish the British dock. And you know what? If young Kieran is going to be taking his game off to Leeds and has decided that's the route he's going to go, shall he? But Alex Graham, we, we've got to kind of keep him attached to this group somewhere, surely, because... One day we're going to have to be calling upon him, are we not, Pete? Yeah, I mean, I look at some of the players that we've had over the past, you know, the Luke Ferraras, and you make a case for actually could Luke have been kept in the fold? Well, at the time, Tomo had a, a tough decision to make and and he went the other way, and that's fine. And they're, they're, uh, that's why the head coaches get paid big bucks because they've got to make those tough calls. If Luke Ferrara was still in Sheffield, Liam Kirk wouldn't have signed an NHL contract. Pretty simple. Exactly. Exactly. And those are the, those are the tough decisions that you have to make. You can't keep everyone at the club and, and you've got to, you've got to let some go, but you're right. Alex is the next generation. You know, we've had the, the Mark Thomases, the Jason Hewitt's coming through. We've currently obviously got the, the Robert Downs and the Jonathan Phillipses, but John is not going to keep playing until he's 60. There's got to be the next generation of players coming through. And Alex looks to be that next talent. And he's shown that he's more than capable of doing it at a you know, national league level. If anything, he's maybe a cut above that, but he's not quite ready for a, a full-time contract at, at Sheffield. So obviously there's players, as we've discussed earlier, like Brandon Whistle playing in front of him that can maybe do more of a role than, than what Alex can. And that's going to come with more games that he plays, that he develops those those extra parts of his game as well. But it, as you said, Dave, it's important to keep him in touch with the club because one day we are going to need an Alex Graham. I was surprised somebody like Manchester never went and tried to sign him full time. You know, forget the two way stuff. Alex, come to us, or Coventry, or or somebody. You know, perhaps not a contender, but in that middle to the bottom echelon that could have offered him proper minutes. I was surprised. And maybe they did. And maybe he's decided to stay against it and, and do the, the Steelers steel dog thing. But um, he's, a, he's a talent and he's one we've got to keep close by, isn't he, John? Absolutely. When Manchester went and pinched um, Hazeldine from, from Nottingham uh, before the elite series, I thought, wow, what a, what a coup that is. And whilst it might not be a great deal now or last season or even this season in terms of the player that he is, you're thinking what you've you've got for the next 10 years, potentially, if you're able to keep him there. You know, you've, you've got a star on your hands and it's the same with Alex Graham. Alex Graham is going to score a lot of elite league goals and I just really hope that they're all in Sheffield. When the Steels were at the Continental Cup, um, we went there with 10 forwards and then in the second game, Conley got hurt and Graham had to play a lot of ice time. Um, sure. He do a lot of work in his own zone. And he performed superbly in that tournament. Couldn't have been more impressed. Scored a couple of goals and his all-round game. And he thought, that's what needed to develop. And it has. But then shortly after that, he was he was out of the team. And you were thinking, well, why is it that, that Whistle is in? And you see Whistle's game over the next year. And you think, ah, okay, yeah. The things that Whistle can offer as a centre, Graham couldn't necessarily do. The issue with the NIHL, and I've watched a lot of those games, you know, I was commentating for the Steel Dogs throughout last season. Again, it, it's almost too easy for, for Alex Graham. He was playing on that top unit with uh, with Jason Hewitt and Matt Bissonette, and they're just, just too good. Yes, they're matching up against other teams' top lines, but it's not the, you know, the intensity and the level of competition that the Elite League is not anywhere close to it. So I'm not sure how much he's actually going to improve his game and, and really develop 
because he'll spend most of his time in the offensive zone and he'll score one plus two, two plus one most nights because that's, you know, he's, he's playing on a top unit with good players and he's going to put up big numbers. It's the rest of his game that needs to come along. And you feel that'll only really happen if he gets uh, if he gets ice time in the uh, you know in the Steelers roster. But any British injury, it's reassuring to know that he's there. But if he played all season on the fourth line, would he score ten goals? Yeah, I absolutely think he would. It would indeed. Just have a quick look around the league right now. Any any surprises? Is it going to be a club that's perhaps out of its natural position come uh, March, April next year? Is I don't it, know. It? I don't know quite at the moment where to place Nottingham and I'll hold my hands up and say I haven't kept track of every single signing. But I just wonder if that's going to be a different club under Omar Pasha um, and the, the head coach that they brought in there, Graham. I just think maybe it's going to have a different feel about it as a club. Um, you know, it's had, you know, behind the scenes so much stability for such a long time. But I, I don't I don't feel like Omar Pasha, even though he's, you know, this director of hockey role now, that he's not going to have some kind of Pasha imprint on that team. And we always know how tough they are to play against an Omar Pasha team. So I just wonder if Nottingham are going to be a, maybe a couple of people's dark horse surprises. Obviously Cardiff have brought back Joey Martin and a couple of guys that have been there previously. They look fairly stable. Their top six, basically five of their top six remains. Mm. And the one that's gone, he's been replaced by Joey Martin, who's Cardiff's goat. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Cardiff are going to be. Interesting with Bounds going back to Cardiff. Don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, John. Yeah, he's absolute quality. But the the extra benefit you get from Ben Bounds is that you can have the 14th skating import. Cardiff don't have a 14th skating import. They've signed 14 imports. Uh, sorry, non-homegrown players, we should call them. Um, but one of them is Taron Cozen, who will, will be his backup. Um, so unless another player is coming in, they're not going to get the full value of Ben Bounds, which is you can have the extra skater out there and sign the extra non-homegrown skater. One of Richardson, Davies, Duggan, Batch or Waller won't be able to make the 20. So getting Bounds in is great, but it doesn't feel like the roster construction is, is quite right. They seem to have got too many pieces for everything to fit together. Just going back to the point about Nottingham, yeah, they might have had some stability, um, but was it all getting a bit stale? It certainly seemed like that from that the fans were starting to get disengaged, but we saw what happened with, with Nottingham Forest um, back in the Premier League and just what a feel-good factor there is now around Forest when they'd been you know away from where they thought they'd been for such a long time. My concern is that that's going to spread through to the Panthers and with... Pasha giving them a new direction. They've got an experienced coach behind the bench. They've taken quality players from Coventry and Manchester and Ferrara and Brady. You know, those sort of games that Nottingham would lose in the past because Brady would have a great day and they'd go to cut Sky Dome and lose because Ferrara would get a couple on the power play. They've taken players away from teams that maybe have beaten them in the past. Their team looks strong. We don't know much about the goalies. If, if they're good, yeah, Nottingham can well could easily be contenders. You talked about Cardiff. They lost Stephen Dixon, of course, who went to Glasgow, and Glasgow have made a little bit of a punch as well, haven't they? They've kind of come knocking on the door at the, you know, looking to join the party. Um, their coach is a is a forthright chap, isn't he? And he's uh, my understanding is he phoned every player in the elite league this summer, basically just you know he's a, he's a second hand Carl salesman, but a good one, and he, he's, he's persuaded a lot of good players to go there. Yeah, and Matthew Wars back for another year as well. We know what he can do, but and he's kept a lot of the the pieces you know mm. from last season, and he looks like he's built on that. I mean, we all know the story of Glasgow last season; they had that that late start to the season and they seem to build as they went through. So if they're picking up from where they left off last season, then yeah, there's a lot for, for Scottish hockey fans to, to be excited about there. But my, my con well, not concern, but I, I was chatting to, to a, a couple of Northern Ireland journalists about um, Belfast giants and about Peyton Jones. And I don't think everyone is quite sold on the new net minded to re replace Beskawani. Yes. He's, a similar size at six three, 
but is he going to be as good? And there were so many games last year that Besco just stole. You know, you remember obviously the the double header in Sheffield and that get that game where, you know, Latal and there's that paddle save that Besco makes on on Latal and you know Valorand on the doorstep and just couldn't quite punch it home. There were those couple of games that I think Besco just stole for Belfast coming down the stretch. And is Peyton Jones going to do the same? I think jury's out until we see him. Let's hope not, eh, Jonathan? Let's hope not. Yeah, um, again, but they've got proven quality back up in, in Jackson Whistle. You know, things don't, if don't start well for Peyton Jones. But, you know, just on pure numbers in the East Coast League, Peyton Jones in 50 games, 3.21 goals against, save percentage under 90. Greenfield was 2.7 and a safe percentage of, well, touching 92. We're in Belfast as well. So, yeah, I know which one I based off those numbers. Yeah. The thing with Belfast as well is they don't very often bomb a player out and bring another player in, do they? They're no. fairly loyal. Like, you know what? Say what you like about our club, but if things ain't going right, see you later, replacement comes in. Where Belfast are a club where very rarely does a player... You know, you 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 wake up in the morning to the press release that the Giants have released a guy. So that they'll ha- they'll give him patience in there. And like you say, they do have Jackson Whistle to uh, to ably back him up. He could start. I still think in half a dozen um, elite league clubs, Jackson. But uh, he's obviously settled in. He's settled in Belfast. Yeah, interesting. Go back to Glasgow again. They've gone for the first time down the two import netminder route. Um, Guildford have have done the same, trying to sort of strengthen their position in that the middle of the table. But I look at, at Guildford and, and Coventry in particular, and they need some hidden gems in there because at the moment, I think there may be still a couple of signings still to come, but it doesn't look like there's enough goals in those rosters for them to cause serious problems in terms of can they gate crash the top four? Because, um, you know, you know, Guildford have lost Watson on the back end. You know, they've gained um, O'Connor. I think well, that'll certainly... Uh, should provide some offence from uh, from defence. But, you know, John Dunbar has been such an important part of what that first line has been able to produce for Guildford over the years. And you think about what they've done in their short time in the Elite League. They've made a Challenge Cup final and two playoff final fours. Um, and Dunbar has been front and centre of it. And now he's off in Glasgow. You know, that's a pretty good like-for-like swap on, on Colton Yellowhorn. So it seems like Guildford might be in danger of just slipping back from where they've been, which is comfortably fifth or sixth. Um, I think they need some more goals. Yeah. Coventry lost goals in Ferrara, though his second year wasn't as good as his first year. They've bought Yellow Horn in. They were brave, weren't they, to let Ferrara go. The money was just too high and they decided they could spend it better over several other players. Um, but it was a big call that Danny Stewart made there, Pete. Yeah, I think so. And it, it's Nottingham's gain, isn't it? So, yeah, it's um, yeah. I agree with Jonathan. I don't quite. It doesn't quite add up where all those goals are going to come from for Coventry. Um, did Pereira and- score as many goals on the big ice in Nottingham as he did on the small ice in in Coventry. That that I guess that's the the trade. I'm I'm not worried about whether Luke Ferrara can score goals at this level. He can. He'll be fine. Yeah. Going back to Guildford, though, obviously Ian Waters is retired as well, and that was another key piece of their mm. offensive puzzle. So. Yeah, that's a, another question, and and there may well be some. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if Guildford have got any more to, any more to come. But you lose Dunbar and you lose Waters, and all of a sudden it didn't. Qu- it's not quite the same Guildford flame side it's been for the last three or four seasons, is it? No, wheels have come off the old Ben O'Connor wagon, haven't they? A little bit, and like I'm a mate of Ben's, and I love him to death. But you know, he went to Cardiff, he didn't work out. He then went back abroad again, and he got his game together. It's really last chance saloon, isn't it? So he's coming to that age now. He's, he's got to make Guildford a success because there ain't any more places really for him, for him to go. So on a personal level, I hope, I hope he does well there. But if he does have a good year there, that, that might kickstart Guildford maybe. I certainly think that's what Paul Dixon will be hoping for. Um, one thing that I think he will get there is mostly plenty of playing time. Yeah. But also it's, it's back in the Elite League, but it's I'd say out of the limelight. Guildford tend to be in the middle of the table in terms of points, but last in publicity and attention. No one seems to sort of look out for their results. They're not so big on social media. There's, And I think it's just a chance for him to just get his head down and play yeah. some good hockey. You know, went to Romania, won a championship. 
And again, mm. without as much fanfare as you would get you know, if he came back to Sheffield or um, you know returned back to Cardiff, I think uh, I think it's a good spot for him. Okay. Well, a week or so to go before uh, that first uh, double header against Nottingham. It'll be interesting, won't it, to see that new Nottingham team, Pete? I'm sure you'll be there on the uh, on the 27th as we as we all will be there. That Steelers Panthers rivalry is still crucial, isn't it? Not only for us and Nottingham, but for the elite league. It's the it's the premium derby. And I expect those two games to be a little feisty because there's a lot of people sticking the chest out and giving it a go, aren't they? Want to prove themselves even on day one, Pete. Yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting one. And and that's that being the first time that the two teams hit the ice, I think we'll, you know, it'll all get left out there and and we'll see what kind of teams that we've got. I think it's a little unfortunate for Nottingham that Garrett Hunt isn't out there and we don't get a chance to see what what he was all about. But um, yeah, that that I think that might have been an interesting one with McNally and, and Mitchell and a few others. So uh, yeah, well, we'll maybe have to save that one for another day. You surely get excited over a Nottingham game, don't you, Jonathan? I do. I, I don't get excited by generally by preseason games, by exhibition games, but I just know what Steelers' social media could be like on the evening of the 28th, if the Panthers have swept those two games across that first weekend of our preseason, if the Panthers have won both of those, the Steelers fans are not just going to be pressing the panic button, they're going to be jumping up and down on it. So results do matter because this is one of the teams that the Steelers are going to be measuring themselves against and need to be better than. So what an opportunity to set down an early marker. Our fans overreact? Surely not. Um, But then again... Pete, if the results go the other way and Sheffield do the double over Nottingham, what a great start to the year. Yeah, great start. Less than a minute left. Good timing. Perfect. Great timing. Jonathan, Pete, thank you for all your help in the summer and thank you for your uh, thoughts on this podcast. 27th in Beirut, 28th at home against the Nottingham Panthers, 4pm face-off, doors open to uh, 30. Don't forget to bring cash. That 50-50 is going to go again this year.